that's really great. Now, what kind of reception have you received to this in South Africa? It's been really, really, really fantastic. Yeah. So the other experience is that through the Maker Library, it's opening up creative spaces. Before the Maker Library Network, it, not easy as general public to understand what happens in an architectural studio, what happens in a conceptual design office. Um, by hosting these open public sessions, our maker libraries open those spaces. So it's been incredibly well received. Uh, this past weekend, we also launched the very first mobile maker library. So a maker library that's small enough to fit in a van that allows us to share it even further and wider. Um, oh, around the country, yeah. Mm. Now tell me about the mobile maker library. Where mm -hmm. has it gone? Where is it going? So we kicked off this weekend. Mm -hmm. Our first stop was at the Guild, at the Art Fair. Um, it's really interesting to engage with, yeah, with the members of the public that are mm -hmm. interested in, in that level of design. The next day we went to Kailicha, which was a lot of fun. Um, again, we connected with local community organizations beforehand to invite them to come and participate and to see there's this connection between the practical making and having relevant literature that brings even the concept of a library to life in a, in a very different way and in a very mm -hmm. exciting way, especially for our youth and communities. Um, on Saturday, the mobile was at Neighbor Goods Market, which we know locally is a really popular destination. And it's just, it's a medium for us to engage a lot more people in simple practices of making. Um, and our librarians in the whole world, I guess, are really interested to learn. So by having a mobile, we can also go out and identify ways of innovation, ways of making uh, that aren't usually part of contemporary lifestyles or contemporary making and designing uh, spaces. Gareth, how long have you been involved in the Maker Network for? It's about a one year exactly. Okay. Um, so I've, see, I've been in, involved from the very beginning, mm -hmm. and actually we were involved in the Maker Library Network before the Maker Space existed. So we've kind of grown up together, and actually the way that we operate uh, our programming in the in the Maker Space mm -hmm. is very much influenced by uh, what we've learned from the Maker wow. Library Network. Now, how have you seen it develop? Well. Um, the core, the core ideas of make, show, and read, and I think comes in there as well, yeah. uh, the, the core ideas of that um, have each kind of developed separately. Yeah. So we've seen um, the, the, the kind of using, using the model as a way of programming workshops has been very successful. Um, we had a very good conversation with one of our partner maker libraries in Johannesburg, Mode, about how they're using their maker library as a way of running public workshops. So kind of, especially local kids, kind of, yeah. originally they were just coming into the space. Mm -hmm. And then, but by having the maker library, suddenly they're like, oh, let's put on workshops. And so the maker library has given, almost given a, an umbrella and a reason and an excuse mm -hmm. to then program the, these, kind of, these kind of workshops. Um, for me, the most successful part of the program in London has been a way of, um, creating a series of micro residencies. Um, and by that I mean I, I invite in a maker, perhaps somebody who's never used the machines that we have like 3D printers or laser cutters, and they get one month to try something out. And at the end of that one month we do a showcase. Um, and deliberately pitched those showcases, um, heavily inspired by the kind of ethos of the maker library, that they're not finished things, they're mm -hmm. prototypes or experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and the artists, designers and, and makers I've, I've worked with really engage with that idea because what you're, what you're showing, it's, it's less formal. It's kind of, here is something I tried out on a, on a, on a 3D printer. It doesn't, it's not finished, it's not perfect. You couldn't sell it. It might crumble when you touch it. <laughs> but what you're looking at is the process of making. You know, making's oh, a, wow. a verb, it's a thing you do. And these, so I've done three of these three of these um, uh, showcases and mm -hmm. I managed to bring, bring one of the collections from, from the showcase to the show that's in 75 Harrington at the moment. I think it's on for another week. Yeah. Wow. Now how many things did you bring with you? I brought a 3D printed breathing head uh, all the way it's from, true. from London. <laughs> uh, I don't and even that, understand <laughs> the words that are coming out of the head, the head. The head is the size of a head on a plinth head height 
Uh, there's a whole mechanism that was all built using the laser cutter and, and kind of f proper tinkery skills. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that because of the Maker Library, that, uh, that object now exists in the world. How did you get that through customs? <laughs> 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 I did say to the lady in customs, I'm really worried, but I think I may have packed something that looks like a bomb. Did you tell her that? <laughs> <laughs> Honesty is the best policy, right? I, what I did is I, 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 I wrote art. I wrote art, 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 art on every single thing. <laughs> now, okay, well now we know. <laughs> we must just label the thing yeah. in our uh, bags.